Olá, bem-vindas e bem-vindos. Eu sou a Mariana Almeida e este é o McKinsey Talks, direto do estúdio da McKinsey em São Paulo. Para compensar as emissões de carbono até 2050, a União Europeia decidiu criar um inédito mecanismo de ajuste de carbono na fronteira, o CBAM, na sigla em inglês. A intenção é tributar mercadorias com base nos gases de efeito estufa emitidos durante a sua produção. Assim, para chegar ao E, os produtos importados pagarão o mesmo preço que os produtos do bloco já pagam pelo carbono. Inicialmente, apenas alguns produtos estavam sujeitos a essa taxação aduaneira, como alumínio, cimento, energia elétrica, ferro e aço. Mas em uma votação em junho de 2022, o Parlamento Europeu propôs alterações ao CBEM, incluindo uma série de novos produtos em seu escopo, como hidrogênio e amônia, além de emissões indiretas da eletricidade usadas no processo de produção. As novas taxas para entrada de mercadorias da Europa podem tornar muitos produtos brasileiros ainda mais competitivos, além de acelerar o desenvolvimento do mercado regulado de carbono por aqui. As regras só devem entrar em vigor a partir da segunda metade da década, mas os nossos especialistas vão mostrar por que o assunto já está quente. Então, para falar sobre esse tema, estão conectados conosco Anna Moore, sócia da McKinsey em Londres, e Bran Smith, sócio da McKinsey em Amsterdã. Por isso, a nossa conversa hoje será em inglês. Welcome, Anna. Thank you for joining us here again. Thank you so much for having us back. It's a pleasure. Hi, Bram. It's such a pleasure to have you here. Welcome. Thank you so much, Mariana, for having us today. Pleasure to be here. E também está conectado conosco Henrique Seoto, sócio da McKinsey em Belo Horizonte e líder da prática de sustentabilidade no Brasil. Olá, Henrique. Bem-vindo novamente. É um prazer falar mais sobre sustentabilidade aqui com você hoje. Olá, Mariana. Excelente estar de volta. Obrigado pelo convite. Muito bem. Então, vamos lá. So, let's get started. Bram, let us begin with you. Can you explain very shortly what is CBAM for those who are not aware of? Absolutely. So CBAM stands for Carbon Border Adjustments Mechanism. And it was proposed uh, by the European Commission uh, last year, in the summer of 2021, as one of the key initiatives in the Fit for 55 uh, policy proposals. And in aggregate, those proposals uh, were defined to help the European Union reduce its greenhouse gas emissions by 55% by 2030, hence the name Fit for 55, and uh, move to net zero by uh, 2050. Now, CBAM will be a mechanism to support the EU's emission trading scheme. And CBAM will basically assess the carbon contents of products that are imported into the EU and will then apply a carbon tax to these products that is in line with the carbon price that producers within the EU uh, would pay. And as such, CBAM is an important initiative because it creates, in a way, a level playing field within the EU between EU-based producers and importers from, from other parts of the world. And as such, it also uh, supports important evolutions in the ETS itself. To, to explain that further, today many sectors have free allowances of emission rights that are in place to avoid carbon leakage, where production of carbon intensive goods moves to other parts of the world where the carbon cost is lower. Now going forward, these free allowances can be reduced gradually while in parallel producers from outside the EU bloc uh, will be taxed in line with the ETS. Now, finally, to comment on the process, and that's relevant also to understand uh, the discussion today, um, the proposal had been uh, launched last year in the summer, in July 2021. Now, this summer, in 2022, there was news because first, the European Council, which consists of the heads of state uh, of all the member countries, reached an agreement that's largely supporting the Fit for 55 package. And at the same time, the European Parliament has discussed amendments and in several areas is also asking for a higher level of ambition. Now, the negotiations or trilogues between the Commission, the European Council and the European Parliament, they're expected to continue in the next couple of months. So in the initial timeline, uh, they were supposed to be finished by the end of this year, but in a way, we'll see the next few months uh, how that exactly is going to play out. Nonetheless, from the developments that we've already seen in the past few months, It's interesting and important to understand some of the implications that we look forward to, uh, to discuss with you today. Great, thank you. It's very clear now. And so uh, you mentioned the, the, the new amendments. 
So uh, what recent developments, what changed since the first text and what are the possible implications? Yeah. So I think there's there's three key areas where uh, the parliament in particular has proposed changes. First, it's the scope of emissions. Second, it's the uh, scope of industries covered by CBAM. And third, it's the timelines that we're looking at. Now, to start with the scope of emissions, um, in its initial proposal, the European Commission had proposed that CBAM would uh, at least initially focus on scope one emissions, meaning that it only focuses on direct emission, emissions uh, that are associated with the uh, production process. Now, the European Parliament has proposed that also scope two emissions uh, would be included, meaning the indirect emissions associated with electricity usage in the production process. And that matters a lot, particularly for electricity intensive uh, products, think about aluminum, where aluminum from countries with a large share of coal in the power mix, for example, would now face much higher uh, carbon content and therefore uh, content, uh, carbon cost also uh, under CMEN. Second, um, the scope of industries is under uh, discussion. And as you said, Mariana, the initial proposal included five uh, industries, aluminum, cement, electricity, fertilizer, and iron and steel. This is now proposed to be expanded uh, by a couple of uh, sectors, namely uh, hydrogen, organic chemicals, and also polymers. Now, this matters because, for example, for hydrogen, the implication is that there will be a distinction made between gray hydrogen uh, that's produced using natural gas or green hydrogen from electrolysis or blue hydrogen where uh, uh, the emissions are, are uh, captured. Um, now, third, the timelines are being discussed. Um, the initial proposal includes a transition phase starting in 2023 that would last for three years until the end of 2025. And then a second phase where the CBAM tax will gradually be brought into effect uh, between 2026 and 2035. Now, the European Parliament has proposed to start that second phase where the tax will then be levied one year later in 2027 but to then implement it at an accelerated pace, such that uh, CBAM would be fully into effect by 2032. And as a bit of context, the European Council, of, uh, consisting of the heads of states, has proposed to still start in 2026, but have an in initially a, a slower pace uh, to, uh, to phase out uh, uh, free allowances and increase that speed only post-2030. Uh, okay, thanks. Anna, would you like to add anything else? So I think the main things to then think about is, you know, what does this mean for um, a Brazilian producer? And if I dwell on that for a minute, you know, there are a few things. Um, and Hiki, you should you should add on as well. The first is the inclusion of scope two makes many Brazilian exports even more competitive because of Brazil's wealth of hydropower. And so when we spoke to you earlier about CBAM and Fit for 55, we talked about how Brazilian steel, for example, would be advantaged in Europe because it's relatively less carbon intensive, even on a scope one basis, um, than a lot of European production, and for sure than you know, Chinese um, and other production. That's even more true, and it becomes true for other commodities as well. Secondly, though, the inclusion of some new categories and sectors, like Bram was saying, and I'm going to pick on hydrogen in particular and then talk a bit about ammonia, means that there could be new export opportunities as well for Brazil. And so, again, this distinction between gray and green hydrogen means that, you know, a producing country like Brazil that has hydropower could be a meaningful green hydrogen exporter to Europe. That's an enormous opportunity, especially when you think about the amount of funding that, that Europe as a whole is putting into developing hydrogen infrastructure across the continent. So that's another enormous opportunity. The other change that's come through the shift in sectors that Bram was describing is Europe is now clearly including organic compounds in the scope of CBAM. They had previously said, yes, we're going to include fertilizers. There was some debate about whether or not ammonia would be included you know, per se or just um, indirectly through fertilizers. Now that's squarely going to be um, considered part of CBAM. That means as well, and this I think is a, a, a fairly new um, avenue to explore, that means that Brazil could also consider green ammonia exports to Europe, um, which could be you know, quite an interesting opportunity. I think the final piece to just add on to Bram's list of changes that's relevant for 
anyone who's exporting to the EU is that versus, you know, in the initial policy discussion when Europe had been considering having national level administrative bodies, huge amount of paperwork, very complicated process. They've now said, look, we realize we need to have a Europe wide CBAM authority. And so it will be a lot easier for producers to comply and for exporters to comply with CBAM. And so I think that's good news for anybody um, who's thinking through how do they gear up for this new um, set of rules. Great. So Enhiki, what's your perspective on that? No, I fully agree with Anna, right? I think the changes uh, create a few opportunities, right? Uh, the first one is related to everything associated with green metallics or green steel, right? Uh, if you think with the inclusion of scope two, um, what it creates is the ability to have, instead of exporting hydrogen to Europe and exporting uh, either iron ore or iron pellets to Europe, you could actually do the reduction here and export it as a green metallic and even further advancing into the chain and exporting um, green steel, right? So this is actually better overall because the cost of transporting H2 in the form of ammonia is extremely expensive, right? Uh, it's expected that by 20, uh, 2030, Brazil can produce hydrogen at about $1.5 per per uh, per kilo. Uh, and uh, the what you would need uh, just to transport that into Europe you would add about another two dollars. So it's extremely expensive, right? If you could do the whole process here and export the metallics, it's a much better um, economic value for both Brazil and Europe, right? The second element that I fully agree is related to ammonia, because the um, and Brazil has always been a net importer of ammonia, right? And with uh, the inclusion of scope two and our competitiveness in doing in creating hydrogen and the carrier of hydrogen, uh, the most um, the, the most advanced today is ammonia, right? Brazil can actually become an exporter of ammonia, which will create a lot of benefit for the cost of fertilizers produced in Brazil, anyhow, right? So it's uh, the the whole evolution of CBAN is very positive for Brazil overall. Okay, so Henrique, do you think that CBAM could also accelerate the development of the Brazilian regulated carbon market? Mariana, that's an excellent question, right? People need to understand what uh, the, the mechanisms of CBAM and how this play out and how this will actually influence regulated markets, not only in Brazil, but worldwide, right? Mm -hmm. What CBAN, the mechanism of CBAN allows is for you to deduct the value paid for carbon or, or um, greenhouse gas emissions in the country of origin, right? So for example, if I'm exporting something into Europe and that product I have to pay, I don't know, $100 per ton or 100 euros per ton to be imported in Europe. And if I had, if I paid already 50, in Brazil, for example, the amount that I'm going to pay in Europe is only 50, right? It's only the difference, right? And that creates an incentive for governments of countries that have significant exports to Europe, for example, Brazil, to actually create local uh, carbon markets or local carbon taxes, because instead of uh, the producer paying that tax in Europe, they would pay in the home country, right? So given that, it's likely that this actually accelerates the, um, the development of the, mar of the regulated carbon market. And that's also positive, because to Anna's point that the systems, uh, we're going to have to report the amount of carbon or greenhouse gas that is contained in the product, right? A regulated carbon market, we already create the infrastructure for that, that inventory to be properly done, right? And so it's another step to, that incentivizes and actually shows that it's actually good for Brazil to implement um, a regulated carbon market. Okay, I love your examples and explanation because they made it very clear, very concrete. So, um, Bram, perhaps it, it would be interesting to give the audience a perspective 
and a slightly hint on how the other countries are dealing with the carbon taxes. Now, it, it, it's helpful to note that um, historically, uh, Europe uh, has been a bit of a front runner uh, in this space, and we actually also see that with, with the, the CBAM uh, initiative. That said, uh, we have seen uh, um, uh, select progress actually also in a couple of other uh, countries around the world uh, more recently. First of all, uh, uh, both Canada and also the UK are also investigating now uh, uh, border carbon adjustment uh, mechanisms. Um, and as part of the discussions that we've seen evolve over the past uh, year or so since, since uh, the European Commission announced uh, its CBAM plans, um, it is believed that this can be a trigger for many more uh, countries, actually, to, to, to also start uh, considering similar uh, setups and mechanisms. Um, next to that, we see uh, uh, in the US specific states uh, uh, having uh, uh, carbon uh, markets or carbon prices in place. The biggest carbon market is in China, and actually 2021 was uh, the first uh, uh, basically full compliance cycle for the, for the national market there. Uh, th that's a good example. And then we see multiple other countries that have uh, carbon prices in place already. Examples include Korea, uh, New Zealand, uh, uh, also um, Argentina, Mexico that have carbon taxes in place, where in, in, in several of those we've seen uh, a really strong price increases, at least through part of the past uh, 12 months. That indicates that gradually uh, the, the working of these markets is also uh, moving forward. That said, and, and actually, then that's maybe a final reflection. Um, we had the, the COP26 uh, conference uh, in Glasgow last year, where one of the agreements actually focused on new rules for international carbon markets. And it's believed that uh, implementing those rules and further working them out will, in a way, also pave the way then for, for further cross-country collaborations and trades uh, in, in the years to come. Anna, there have been questions about whether carbon taxes are compatible with ensuring a just transition. How is the European Union thinking about it? Yeah, thanks for the question. And I, I think it's relevant to how Brazilians think about how the EU policy will evolve, but also, to Hiki's point, relevant to how uh, policy might evolve within Brazil itself. Maybe two reflections about a just transition. One is just transition between nations. So Bram mentioned earlier that inclusion of scope two will add on significant cost to um, aluminum that's produced in coal-fired plants. And so if you take Mozambique as an example where the energy mix is relatively dirty, but 80% of Mozambican aluminum is exported today to the EU, you know, that's potentially catastrophic to that economy. And so Europe is quite conscious of that in designing CBAM, and there will need to be, and the, the European Parliament already has this in mind, um, thoughtfulness around how that element of, of policy is managed. What that means in practice, they still need to tell us, um, but this is one area where just transition becomes quite an important topic. Secondly, though, is what does it mean um, domestically within the EU or within any country that has a carbon tax? You've had in some EU countries questions about how will um, this tax revenue be spent? How can we ensure that this doesn't just drive up the cost of goods even further for your average household that's buying goods that are covered by ETS and by CBAM? Um, and so the European Union intends to um, in part redistribute some of the revenue that's collected as part of CBAM, similar to how they do with the EU modernization fund today where the taxes collected through ETS are disproportionately given back to lower income EU countries. Um, that doesn't solve the question of what does this do to prices for average households? Um, that still needs to get worked through, but this is the other piece as we think about just transition that the implementing acts will need to address. Okay, unfortunately, we are reaching the end of the session. And to wrap up our conversation, what do you three think is most important for CEOs listening to us right now to retain from our conversation? So, Anna, if you could start, please. Sure. Enormous opportunities, especially for a country that is so rich in clean power as Brazil. At the same time, we've talked about the reshuffling of the chessboard. And one theme that I would keep in mind is 
you know, a lot of um, more carbon intensive European producers will now be looking for new homes for their own production. And a lot of the dirtier exporters to Europe will be looking for new homes as well. And so while Europe is now a new opportunity for CEOs, there's also a need to be thoughtful about how the rest of the chessboard will reshuffle. Thank you, Bram. Now, I think those are great points. And, and, and the one thing I would add is um, we've described today how there's quite a bit of uncertainty still as the, the negotiations and discussions in Brussels uh, are going to continue. At the same time, it also uh, seems very clear what the direction of travel is. And, and a lot of the key building blocks are becoming pretty clear. And one could argue whether the actual implementation date is going to be 2026 or 2027, and how exactly the transition phase will be shaped. Those are important details, but at the same time also uh, um, uh, the, some of the, of the opportunities that we're discussing here um, really will also require multi-year uh, programs and multi-year investments in order to get ready. So in a way, even if timelines and specificities remain a bit uncertain, uh, in a way, the, the implications start to be relevant today. And, and that would be an encouragement to start playing this through. And Enhiki, what are your final thoughts? Mariana, I fully agree with uh, Bram and Anna uh, on their perspectives. Uh, Brazil is what you may call a green hidden gem, right? Or yet to be uncovered. And there's so many opportunities associated with this green economy and preparing for CBAN, be it on the reorganization of the global flows and the opportunity to procure um, some, some materials cheaper, or be it on the export to Europe of green products. Um, it's uh, just an ocean of opportunity. And it's important to think about this now because the investment cycles for most of this, these products are quite large. So if you want to be ready to capture it as of 2027, uh, CEOs and the government need to start thinking about this now. Okay. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for having us. Thank you, Mariana, for having us. Muito obrigada também a você que nos acompanha em vídeo em podcast. Para entrar em contato com os nossos especialistas, o nosso e-mail é mackinsey-talks.com. Você também pode enviar perguntas para o próximo episódio desta série sobre sustentabilidade. Participe! A agenda completa do McKinsey Talks está no mackinsey-talks.com. Lá você também pode conferir este episódio e os anteriores em vídeo ou em podcast. É isso aí, muito obrigada! E até a próxima.